Welcome back to the channel, friends and family and intimate reading associates. It's a good day. Is it not? We have a very fun program for you today. <laughs> Thank you for tuning in to your local YouTube channel. I'm your host, Ian, with the next 30 minutes. But anyway, in today's video, peeps, we are going to be reading and reviewing one star reviews of my favorite book series. Now, this was a very big undertaking because Ashlyn, my dear, dear, beautiful wife, she just slaved for the past like two and a half, three hours to find me the funniest reviews. I was review hunting myself just to see if I can find some good stuff. Then she came to me with the brilliant idea that I read them blind. So she actually has just finished finding these reviews for me and I cannot thank her enough. Everybody give her a freaking heart in the in the comments and go subscribe to her channel Ashlyn Kaylee she's amazing so this is kind of based off of my top 10 video if you've not seen my my top 10 favorite book series of all time video go check that out um, but I'm going to be reviewing one star reviews of those series as a whole now some of these reviews may be talking about single books maybe singling out or calling out books not the whole series who knows but <laughs> i'm very excited okay so number 10 we're going to be looking at a court of thorns and roses one star reviews let's see what we got all of these are on goodreads i did find some reddit ones but reddit's kind of sketchy so here we go oh boy i was not a fan of this novel i thought the structure and pacing of it was really bizarre and i think that's because it is a beauty and the beast retelling it was also trying to incorporate too many other ideas i also thought the characters were widely underdeveloped and Farah the protagonist really irritated me but what are you talking about favorite is a great protagonist i get it i get it this is mainly talking about just me shack i'm filming the video this is mainly talking about that first book a court of thorns and roses and i i you know what Call me crazy. But the first half of that book, I was not vibing with it. Feyre was annoying because it, she went from this weird depressed thing to this obsessed romantic with this dude that wears a mask. It was not good. But then the second half begins and Feyre really steps into herself. And from then on, the rest of the series, she becomes a total bad A warrior queen high lady. I mean, that's sick. She becomes something so, so cool. And okay, I'm sorry that she has to develop in a normal way. Come on, just keep going if you didn't finish. I think they hopefully had moved on, but we are also moving on. The next is again for A Court of Thorns and Roses. My favorite line in this book sums up my reading experience. Quote, my bowels turned watery, I couldn't help it. I mean, anytime I think of Tamlin, that's my response. Are you talking that's your whole experience with the book? Is that you got diarrhea? That's your whole experience? I'm sorry. The ending of that book is so good. I don't, I don't get it. Moving on. I'm a second away from dousing myself in gasoline and lighting myself on fire just so I never have to look at this book again. Just throw it out the window! What on earth? That's so extreme. Next, we're getting into The Witcher. The Witcher. Now, I have my own beef with The Witcher, but I still really, really love it. Let's see if I share beef with people. So this is for the first in the saga, which is The Blood of Elves. The book is very hard to read. It has long, lengthy, and very boring conversations between random people. Deal. Yes, it does. The whole series has lengthy conversations between random people. That's my biggest beef with it. But the thing is, the first book is very dialogue driven and it was done that way on purpose. But you still get some pretty cool action scenes, especially near the end. So, I mean, to me, that makes up for it. Instead of telling you about the politics and dynamics like it probably intends to, it is so mind-numbingly boring that I skip several pages regularly. In the first one, I didn't skip a page. In the, in like the next three, yeah, I skipped. I definitely skipped some stuff. If someone asked me what happened in the book, I could not tell anything. First 100 pages are literally the poet show and then street people talking and next 100 poet being attacked and Yennefer saving him. Okay, that doesn't happen in 200 pages. It happens in like 35. That first chapter is very lengthy. And I will tell you, yeah, I was lost like I was in a freaking labyrinth throw. It, I was lost. But once Steady Lion, the poet that this person is talking about, gets attacked, it gets interesting. Because Yennefer shows up. She's a bad lady, man. She's so cool. Cut to Siri with Geralt wherever he is. Last 150 are literally Yennefer training Siri 101. Every process and spell and instructions in great detail. I don't know why this book is so highly rated. I absolutely hate it. Don't waste your time on it. Now that is a horrible thing to say. Do waste your time on it. You just don't appreciate flowery prose. And he's a very flowery writer. Sapkowski is he's building you up to something amazing. Whoop. 
two is stellar. The first half of it kind of made me mad because yes, again, it does that whole lengthy conversation between random characters. But the second half of that book gets insane. And the third book, the whole thing through is phenomenal. So you have to keep going. I do not share this person's grievance. Not a one star review. You can bump that up. Love the game, but the book's not for me. The Witcher 3 is what got me into The Witcher in the first place. The Witcher 3 is perfect. Absolutely perfect. It is like a 20 stars out of 10. It is so good. Now the books are difficult. They really are. You just have to get in the mood for it and you have to really just let it take you on the ride. It's worth it in the end. It really is. It's worth it in the end. I just do not like this author's writing style. It's just so jumpy. The story went places, but there didn't seem to be a climax. Perhaps the whole thing was written as a setup for the later books, but this book did nothing for me. It is a setup for the other books. You're you're finally introduced to Siri uh, because in the, uh, in the books before that, you're introduced to Yennefer and Geralt and some other witchers and dandelions. So like when you meet them in the Blood of Elves, you already know who they are. You need introduction to Siri and the saga, book three through seven. The, the saga books is really the story about Siri and Geralt, particularly Siri. It does jump around. I get it. That's my biggest beef with the whole series. It just jumps from A to Q to M to D to X. Like it just, it doesn't have a linear path that it follows. Now that I've had a time away from it, maybe that's kind of the genius of it. Cause like no other author does it that way. And that's, it's not bad. It's not worth one star. That's just mean. Now we're getting into Harry Potter. Here we go. This is for the Sorcerer's Stone. First of all, you have to ask yourself this question. How old am I? If the answer is above 10, please put the book down. You are embarrassing yourself. I would have said 11, but then it occurred to me that today's tweens are probably a little too mature for this book. Yes, I'm sure the rest of the books in the series get better and blah, blah, blah. But unless you are reading this as a bedtime story to a small child, just say no. I wish I had. Okay, okay. Listen here, Lauren. Sugar and snarks. Sorcerer's Stone. Yes, it's very kiddish. But we're following an 11 year old boy. It's gonna be a little bit more kiddish. He's a child for Pete's sake. Those first two novels feel relatively child-esque. But guess what? Get into Prisoner of Azkaban, lady. You got some chat coming your way, okay? This series gets more and more mature as you continue. I think Sorcerer's Stone's a great introduction to Harry Potter. Uh, my only beef with it is it seems really, really fast. It's like 300 pages on the nose and it just, you just fly through the bloody thing. But to say that anyone over the age of 10 or 11 shouldn't read it because it's for kids, it's actually not. You get into Prisoner of Azkaban, Order of the Phoenix, Half-Blood freaking Prince? No, no, that's that's pretty mature, okay? Just because it doesn't have, you know, smut in it, it doesn't mean it's not mature and it gets really dark really fast. So you can take your freaking one star rating somewhere else. This book is so boring. I literally fell asleep. How? I also ended crying because I had so much expectations that I was disappointed with what I read. I also had an extremely bad day at work and I needed some kind of relief. This book did make me smile one bit. I was so disappointed. One should never change the story's title, no matter what. Extremely dramatically disappointed Henrietta Wimple. Why does it say that she read this July 28th, 1988? Shelved as read cliche teenage books, stupid humans, Disney princesses, Italian dystopian. <laughs> I'm sorry you read this on a bad day, but there's no way this book could have made it worse. You fell asleep. It's probably because you were tired after your bad day. Henrietta, Henrietta, I feel like you just had some other issues going on and you you just you just put it all on sorcerer's stuff. Just keep going, honey. You'll you'll love. <laughs> Just says poop. I'm sorry, Chris. It wasn't up to your standards. We're moving on to Lycanius now. This reads like a 2005 fan fiction novel. The dialogue is bad. The characters have zero buildup. The events have no meaning whatsoever. Couldn't keep me in it for more than 10 chapters. 10 chapters? Dude, what? The dialogue is not bad. In that first book, it's not as great as the other two. Dude, the second and the third book, he, he gets better at character work and he gets better at plot and he gets better at dialogue. But you can't give this a one star. It's not garbage. It was really, really good. The Shadow of what was lost is an apt name for this is a shadow of a style of writing which is now lost. The writing is good. I don't understand. Like there's plenty of books that I have not appreciated the writing style, but I've still not given anything one stars. I even gave Tomorrow and Tomorrow and Tomorrow a book that I really, really like the writing style. I gave two stars. It, it wasn't worthy of one. It wasn't complete garbage, but hey. This book is the beautiful sky reflected in a puddle. Sure, it's lovely to glance at, but if you try to dive in, bang your head against the asphalt. Maybe you just didn't get it. I mean, it is a little intermediate. Uh, the Shadow of What Was Lost and the Lycanius trilogy as a whole is pretty deep. He's crafted a really complex world with really complex characters and a lot of crazy socio-political stuff happening simultaneously. To say that it's like a puddle, I think maybe your comprehension level is like a puddle because you even named your thing after the main character. 
one of the main characters, Tal. Oh my gosh, you can't. This has to be satire, dude. What the heck? The Gunslinger. Oh my gosh, we're into the Dark Tower. <sighs> Dustin, let's see what you got to say, brother. No, no, no. I really don't believe people like this book. The story was endlessly confusing. The characters were numerous and uninteresting, and the countless references and metaphors forced. Nothing made sense. Maybe I am stupid. I mean, but I feel like I was once again sitting in my high school English class listening to my pot smoking professor calling us to tell her what the apple really represents. Maybe there actually is a greater meaning. Maybe there was something deeper that I didn't quite grasp. I don't know, but this book wasn't for me. I don't care about the man in black. I don't care about the gunslinger. Oh, that hurts. I don't even care about Jake. You take that back, you sourpuss. I don't care about this book, and unless something drastically changes, I don't plan on reading any more in this series. Oh yeah, this was also my first Stephen King book. Weird, right? Hey, it was my first Stephen King book too, and I loved it. The Gunslinger, it is spacey. It is kind of like you're walking through an acid trip with a cowboy. That's just how the world is, okay? When you get into the drawing of the three, the wastelands, the wizard in glass, the world is messed up. That's the whole point. The world's multiple. The universe, the multiverse, whatever you want to call it, it's all messed up because the dark tower is either collapsing or dying or whatever. Everything is messed up because of it. Yes, the gunslinger doesn't really make sense, but at the same time, it makes a lot of sense. And you should care about the gunslinger because Roland Shane of Gilead is one of the coolest fictional characters you'll ever read. You have to get to Wizard and Glass because you get to know so much about him. And he, be, he will quickly become one of your favorite characters. If you didn't get it, you didn't get it. Firstly, it doesn't have the story or feel of one novel. No, it doesn't. It's so open-ended, it leaves it to the mind to think, hey, this could literally be four books in one. And he plays on so many different things from that first book in so many of the other Dark Tower novels. So just keep going. The story seems disconnected and forced together. The vignettes hang together poorly and the force driving the actions are weak and confusing. I think that one is supposed to be so marveled by the character and setting that they allow the story itself to slip by unremarked or cared about. I wasn't marveled. I wanted to be compelled, but I wasn't. Dude, when he meets Jake, that's so compelling. The writing itself seems raw and confusing compared to other books by King. I'm sure people like his horror stuff better. Whatever. The story takes leaps and bounds leaving the reader in the dust, trying to piece it all together. That's not always a bad thing when the stakes are high or there is some reward, but a cowboy chasing Randall Flagg, the stand, through a post-apocalyptic Old West plagued by demons ain't it for me. Hear that again. Hear how he just described this, guys. A cowboy chasing Randall Flagg through a post-apocalyptic Old West plagued by demons. You couldn't have described it any better. And it gets even more incredible than that. Maybe it could be, but not in this book. This book tries to bite off more than it can chew and chokes. The idea is there, but the story never shows up. I've read that this book isn't a good sample of the series. I don't know if that's true, but I do know that this book sucks. Maybe I'll try book two someday. Skip it. Don't skip it. You need to read The Gunslinger or Drawing of the Three to make sense. The whole series. Oh man, the whole series. I, you know, people say it's not a good sample of the series. People usually rant and rave about books two and three, and they are solid novels. The Gunslinger sets you up for those. You have to read that 251 page book to get to the meat. But I loved The Gunslinger because it was my first introduction to King and it was my first introduction to the, one of the most imaginative things I've ever read in my life. I don't want to talk about it. I'm just going to block this book out. Act like it never happened. <laughs> well, you can't act like it never happened because it did happen and it's here to stay, Zena. Now we're getting into George R. R. Martin, A Song of Ice and Fire. Finally, I finished this absolute drivel. It dragged on and on. So much bored me no end. To no end? May I help you finish your sentence? Did the author get paid by the word? <laughs> I get it, it's like a 500,000 word book. I mean, it's a hefty sucker, man. <laughs> I'm not gonna lie. I could pick it up and put it down easily. It was not enthralling, but for several engaging characters, their stories, and the last few chapters. The last few chapters are good. They are. The rest of the book behind it is also very good as well. By the end, two people I liked were killed off. Let's not talk about that. That alone broke me. It broke my spirit. Let's not reopen that wound, shall we? It sounds like the author is going to play, and then there were with his characters. He certainly has enough to work with and can always invent more to take the place of those he's bumped off. That's true. I think by the end of it, there's only five Song of Ice and Fire books, but there's like a thousand some odd characters that he's actually named, which is insane. Most figures are cardboard and many are unpleasant, even cruel or amoral. That's the whole point. Most of the characters are garbage human beings. They're supposed to be cruel and amoral, especially the Lannisters. That's the point. At least I'm seeing what all the excitement is about, but I do not understand so many absolutely positive reviews. I could see possibly Shades of Wars of the Roses, Hadrian's 
wall and others interpretation of a tribal people such as the Scythians. One particularly gruesome death is reminiscent of a real one in ancient times. By all means avoid this one. No! I mean, if you if you want to get an epic fantasy and you want best dialogue you're probably going to read besides Pierce Brown, you, you want some absolutely amazing character work? Dude, George R. R. Martin nails it on the head. But hey, partial review because I stopped reading the book after the first couple chapters. I don't even want to entertain this. First couple chapters? The unbelievably juvenile map at the beginning of the book should have been a clue that this ride was not going to end well. Hey, dude, he drew it himself, okay? The names of the roads, towns, forts, etc. were all so, I'm going to say, stupid. The Haunted Forest. Forrest, we came up with better names for our D&D adventures when we were only 13. It's fantasy. He can name it whatever the crap he wants. It doesn't have to be the Pythirian Forest. You don't have to copy Tolkien and making up words, okay? It can still just be the Haunted Forest and still be enjoyable. The prose wasn't bad. The prose is amazing. Although the style was a little affected and the storyline predictable. Is that what you're telling me? You, you just saw where things were gonna go? Come on, get out of here. Maybe, except for Tolkien and White, I am just not a big fantasy fan anymore. Although I think it's more the case that most fantasy writers are really just frustrated romance swashbuckler writers who can't write that well. Seems to me that there's a lot better sci-fi out there if I want to suspend my belief in reality. Wow. That felt personal. I just, I get it. Writing is art and art is subjective. So you are entitled to your opinions. Hey, if it's not for you, just say so. This is now for our beloved Red Riley. This book wasn't for me. There was definitely a lot of new terminology that was used and it really confused the heck out of me. It's science fiction. It's going to do that no matter what book you pick up. Sorry to tell you that, but it's true. Sometimes I'm okay with that because the reader will learn more about the world later on, but it just didn't work for me for this book. There were probably over 20 new words for this world in just the first chapter that I had no clue about. It was too much, which made it difficult to get into the story. I felt like I was thrown into this world, which I didn't like. You know what? Fair point. Fair, subjective opinion. You should keep going though. It's well worth your time. I wish there was some sort of glossary or chart about all the colors in this society. Read book two right at the beginning or look up online. We don't need to hold your hand. The beginning of this book was so slow. Honestly, I had no idea what was happening for a majority of the book. It was just a confusing mess because the writing was so hard for me to follow. There were a couple of characters that I did like, but I didn't like Dara, the main character. You don't like the Reaper, bro? I didn't have high expectations going into this book, but I also didn't have low expectations. As you can tell, I ended up pretty disappointed. You know what? I ended up pretty disappointed that you're pretty disappointed. I know I just said it's subjective, but you're wrong. Daryl is so interesting. And the world. First time I read Red Rising, I really, I really didn't like how they didn't get off Mars, but once they get off Mars, dude, it's awesome. It's epic. I'm sorry. I'm sorry I had a bad experience. I can't finish this. That's all you have to say. Well, you should, Sid Nero. Nero. Interesting. Thing. I could not finish this, Leta says. One, I didn't enjoy the author's writing style. Two, I couldn't care about the main character. Three, I began skimming the text by the time I got to page 50. You started skimming at page 50? The, the only times you should skip are smut and poetry. <laughs> Mainly the first. Four, I couldn't keep the names straight of the various supporting characters and didn't care about any of them. You're telling me Severo Barca didn't tickle your fancy? He tickled mine. I loved a lot of these supporting characters. Pax, you're telling me Pax isn't endearing? Oh, well, I mean, you, you really only started skipping after page 50, so you probably didn't get to know anybody. Your fault. Five, the stratified society of colors didn't offer anything new and interesting to the genre. Yes, it did. They are biologically color-coded. That's exactly what a freaking tyrannical regime would do if it had the proper tools to do it. What better way to classify people and, and control everybody? That's that's the whole point. Six, training Darrow to become a better psychopath than all the other baby gold psychopaths didn't hold my interest. <laughs> you know what? They are all kind of psychopaths, aren't they? But Darrow, I don't think he's a psychopath. I think he's just got a lot of trauma and he's also got a lot of hate that he has to get over. And he, and he channels it sometimes very poorly with massive consequences and sometimes he channels it very positively. You just have to give him a chance. Seven, Darrow wrote a drill so he's better at murder and fighting and strategy than all the baby golds? No, it doesn't work for me. I don't think just because he wrote a drill that he's better at murder and fighting. Obviously, these people have a huge advantage because they're born rich with the right tutors and trainers. Like, they knew how to kill way better than Darrow. Just because Darrow had the reflexes of a hell diver, he had reflexes that they didn't and that gave him an advantage in that way. But eventually, he had to learn how to kill like them. That's an unfounded Freaking yeah. Oh man. Now we're getting into Joe Abercrombie's The First Law. I know what a lot of people say about the blade itself. I will tell you right now, it does have a plot. A lot of people say it sucks because there's no plot. It does have a plot. Just read the book. Not great writing, a little interest in story. Two YA. I do not get you. Two YA? 
What are you talking about? It's not for young adults. It is for adults. It's gruesome, it's violent, it's bloody. There's too much in it that makes it for adults. Why, A? Kirk, what are you doing to me? So you need something worse? You need something more violent and brutal? Are you just desensitized? I cleaned up some literal dog diarrhea this morning that I liked better than this book. No one likes cleaning up dog poop. Like, that's your problem. Ugh. I kind of wanted to know more about Logan's story, but didn't want to read the other two characters' chapters. Not worth the slog. To correct you, there's actually four more characters besides Logan. You didn't like Glockta? That is the most mind-exploding thing I've ever heard. Glockta is incredible. He's creepy, he's vile, he's sinister, but man, he just... Joe writes him in such a way that you're just hooked on everything that happens in a Glockta chapter. I don't know how you would rather read Logan over Glockta. I love Logan, don't get me wrong. Bloody Nine is the man. When I turned the last page, I was like, nothing happened? You mean to tell me after all the suffering of forcing myself to read, there's no payoff? Mate! A. Crinkle puts out dumpster fires. Okay, A. Crinkle. There's a huge payoff. I don't want to sound like a broken record. And I really don't want to... <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's just like, I get it. I, I understand where people are coming from, but it's not true. Faithful and the Fallen. These are all five star books for me, so bring it on. I can't even properly refute the author's stance on this one because he somehow thought it was okay to just not use bows, slings, crossbows, and large scale battles, and not even justify it anywhere in the first two books. What, like, he's writing in a time period that wouldn't have crossbows. Yeah, sure, they'd have slings, and they use plenty of bows. I don't know what you're talking about. The only reason, I I could come up with myself is honor. Yeah, honor is a huge part of the warriors aspect in this. It seems to be a big thing in the bandage land. You didn't invent it, so get over it. They like one-on-one -on -one duels and only bandits are cowardly enough to kill from farther away than you can throw a spear. Except that's not true. Several times in the first two books, characters are shown assisting their allies when it's clear they're about to lose. That doesn't sound very fair and one-on-one-y to me. Speaking of honor, Rin, Calidus, Evnus, Lycos, and everyone under them. You just named all the bad guys. Do they sound honorable to you? No, because they're bad guys. That's the point. They don't care about honor. One's a demon. One is a demon. He doesn't care. Do they feel like they'd throw away as big an advantage as long-range missile weapons for the sake of honor? Heck no. And if only the less honorable leaders made use of ranged weapons, then they'd absolutely wreck the good guys if they refused to adopt the same tactic. When that happens, and only the bad guys are left to lead, then they'd make ranged weaponry a common thing, rebranded as a new way of war and not a cowardly option. To me, the bad guys decimating the good guys and making ranged combat combat acceptable is the only natural progression of war carried out by intelligent beings with the capability and need to innovate and outdo each other. Wow. Are you like a student of like military history or something? It just seems like lazy writing to me. The series as a whole is weak and the writing is weak just because he didn't have people use ranged weapons. Do you see how preposterous that sounds? Throughout the book, they invent a new way of warfare. You get how that develops and how that changes the game. I, I didn't really notice that they didn't use bows and I didn't care because at the end they're fighting an enemy that has crazy advantage and most of the time bows wouldn't even have worked. You're gonna give Faithful and the Fallen one star because they didn't use bows? Doesn't make any sense. DNF at 180? It's like a 630 something odd page book. You didn't, you only made 180 pages? You could not pay me to care about this plot or characters. This feels super dated, like it should have been published in the 80s. Why are y'all so impressed? All the characters read the same. Why is the ratio of male to female main characters like seven to one? Rin, Kaiwen, Fidel, Corbin and Kaiwen's mom. Idana? Idana's mother? The female giants? I think there's two main ones. Coralyn! Just because some of the guy chapters get more POV time than some of the ladies doesn't mean it's an unfair ratio. All of the women, good or bad, are strong and important and fierce. Kaiwen and Coralyn are two of my favorite female characters in all of literature. They're bad, bad ladies. Without them, the war would have been lost. You get rid of those two main women, the whole war lost. You made it 180 pages in. That's why you get like maybe three Kaiwen chapters. In that first book, you're mainly focusing on Corbett. He is the main character. To get upset when you only read 180 pages, that's your fault. 
And no, it doesn't feel like it should have been written in the 80s. It feels just right. Lord of the Rings. Lord of the Rings for me can do no wrong. Everything Tolkien has written is five stars. My heart's about to shatter into pieces. Let's read this poison, shall we? I hate this book! I got it three years ago, but never got around to reading it because it seemed so boring. But since everyone loves it so much, I decided to read it. This was awful! The whole book could have been 250 pages shorter if the author had removed the stupid history references, which are of no use, and if he had just written, they walked till they reached so-and-so place? The characters kept walking and camping for 95% of the book? Walk, 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 eat, walk, sleep, walk, 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 battle, then walk, 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 walk. Awful! I hated it! You're talking about Fellowship of the Ring. They are walking from this paradisiacal place to a volcano! It takes months to get there! You forgot to mention that they're being hunted the whole time? That kind of like throws a kink in things, don't you think? They're getting hunted by wraiths. And in some of the creepiest scenes I've still read anywhere, when they first encounter the ring wraiths, that's some creepy, creepy stuff. What? I am hobbit intolerant. I can't stand those little suckers. They're gross feet and they're obnoxiously a idyllic shire. They are romanticized, hairy-footed little people, best described as simple-minded, reactionary caricatures. I'm not gonna disagree, but I'm not gonna agree. The elves are not much better with their magical magicalness and aloof aloofness, but at least they don't have gross feet. They're just bigots. <laughs> I mean, yeah, they hate dwarves, but they don't hate it. Well, they kind of hate everybody. You can't be a bigot if you hate everybody. Then there are all those epic man dudes doing long-winded yet epic man dude things at an excruciating pace, which Tolkien obviously mistook for a mythical feel and epic scale. A mistake that instills in me the raging and irrational desire to resurrect the author for the sole purpose of beating him back into the grave with his magnum opus. <laughs> That's so disrespectful. The half star, you're giving it a half star? Just half, Goodreads is lying to you about this rating. Oh, it's so good, dude, shut, shut your mouth. Honestly, when I do say that in the video, it's all satire. People can have their own opinions, it's fine. I respect your opinion, but dang, dang, dang. You have to at least give it another shot or something. I do respect Tolkien for his contribution to the fantasy genre and literature, but that respect does not necessarily lead to any enjoyment. Fine, fair. Fair. As long as you give the man his due, you can hate his material all you want. Just give him his due. That's all I'm asking. We did it. That was long. That was a lot. I hope this wasn't mundane or boring for you. At the end of it all, people can have whatever opinion they so choose to have. I have my opinions that I love all these series. And some people, as we found out today, a lot of people hate them. That's their preference. I'm not going to call them horrible human beings, and I'm not going to call their opinions stupid, because at the end of the day, it's art, and literature is subjective. So, I'm so glad that you stuck around. Guys, thank you for being here. Love you so much. Like, subscribe, share if you want. Freaking, I'm so happy that this community is growing. You know, we're, we're really building a family here. It's really, really cool. Really fun. So, thank you for your time. Thank you for your patience. And thank you for your love. See you in the next one.